Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. <clears throat> I'm going to read this in sections instead of all at the same time, but we're going to cover the whole chapter. So just for starters, I'm going to read... I'm going to read from verse 12 to verse, let's say, till verse 19, just to get us started here. 1 Samuel chapter 2, 1 Samuel 2. Always forget to turn that on. I apologize, gentlemen. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. Here's what the Bible says. Now, the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand, and he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Also, before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant, uh, servant came and said unto the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. <clears throat> and if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, Nay. But thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Wherefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men abhorred the offering of the Lord. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband, to offer the yearly sacrifice. The Lord's favor. The Lord's favor is the title of the message. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would grant us your favor. I pray that you would grant us your favor, not because we are in church or because we claim to know your name, but because we desire to be faithful to you. Lord, let us not take matters into our own hands. But let us faithfully serve you and trust you and your timing and your control. Help us, Lord, to learn from this story in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. On the hills when every man did that which is right in his own eyes in the book of Judges, on the hills of the time of the Judges, people needed the reassurance that they could put their trust in God even when life seemed out of control. And God used the birth of Samuel, Israel's last judge, and Israel's first prophet to do it. That would have been an awful time to grow up as a believer in Israel. Wouldn't it? Maybe I need to let that sink in a little more. It would have been a very difficult time to live in Israel when every man did that which was right in his own eyes and things were as chaotic as they were at the end of the book of Judges. How many have read the end of the book of Judges? Okay, then you're aware of what I am talking about because it is, it's crazy. Like you read the end of the book of Judges and you think to yourself, how is that even in the Bible? Like people chopping up a, a, a concubine and sending her body parts all over the country to send a message. It's twisted and demented and distorted, and it's awful. It's just awful. It would be really difficult to be a Christian during that time, to be a follower of God. Because even within the priesthood, as you can see in the book of Judges, where you have priests for hire, for ten shekels and a shirt, as, as a famous message was preached, there's not a lot of continuity in doing the right thing during the time of the judges. And you know what the people needed more than anything else? They needed the reassurance that as bad as things looked in the world, 
that they could still trust the timing of God and that he was still in control. Because from the looks of the news, both then and now, it was hard to tell. They needed that assurance. So God opens this part of Israel's history with the story of Samuel. The first of the prophets, the last of the judges. <clears throat> in spite of her barrenness, for which she had no control, Hannah was encouraged to trust the God of Israel. Yet through her story, God was encouraging Israel to trust the God of Hannah. I love it. God, Hannah gets encouraged by Eli in the temple when she's crying out to God in desperation. And Eli says uh, in so many words, you're praying to the God of Israel. He's bigger than your problem. You can trust him. And she does. And as a result, Samuel is born. But in the very story where Hannah is trusting the God of Israel, God is telling Israel, trust the God of Hannah. And trust me. I do have everything in control in my timing. And when God gave Hannah a child that convinced her that no one saves like our God, no one knows us like our God, and no one can reverse the plight of men like our God. Do you remember that from the last time we were here? Even when things appear to be getting worse, we ought to rejoice in God's conquering salvation. Ah, that is a good lesson for today. We don't need the news of ancient Israel. We've got modern day news to freak us out. The time of the judges doesn't look so weird anymore. Isn't that a sad? Like, like it's getting so bad there uh, that uh, we are allowing we are allowing men masquerading as women to be reading to our children in libraries and teaching nonsense in public schools, and it's just we are out of control nuts. We're out of control nuts. It's a good time to be reminded God's still in control. And we can trust in the almighty, all-powerful, conquering salvation of the Lord. And if more of us would put our faith in God's salvation, God would have more freedom to work among us. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> but even as Hannah prayed, as, as she did in the first part of chapter, uh, chapter uh, 2, she kneels down before the Lord. And remember, in Old Testament times, prayer wasn't like we do in modern Baptist churches where we don't even leave our pews, you know? We just, I just got to pray myself. We bow our heads. I'm not saying anything's wrong with that, but this was a different time. And people came forward, and they offered their offering to the Lord, and they made public proclamation so that all would know why they think they could trust God and why they think God ought to be honored and praised. And Hannah knelt before the Lord and began to offer her praise. And she was overwhelmed at the goodness of God. In spite of everything that was happening, she put her faith in God and God came through. And she did it in a temple that was completely corrupt. Completely corrupt. While she's praying... As we're about to find out, Eli is a completely worthless high priest and his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are sadistically evil in the temple. In the temple. <clears throat> but, as I have already expressed these stories, there, there are two ways to look. There's under the microscope. There's the micro level, and then there's the macro level. Where you step back, and you get the bigger picture, and you begin to see these actually aren't random individual stories after all. They're the orchestration of a larger message of God to his people. <clears throat> and it's really a prophetic reflection of Israel. Because Israel's at the point where things aren't working right and they're wondering if it's just best to take care of myself. Like, I think we're done with the rules. God helps those who help themselves. Which is not biblical, just so we're clear. Not a biblical philosophy, but that's kind of what they're thinking. Like, maybe we need to be concerned about the big eye. 
Maybe we need to just focus on things that benefit me. No one else is going to speak up for me. No one else is going to uh, 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 stand and, 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 and vouch for me and, and work for my favor. It's every man for himself. God helps those who helps themselves. And this is kind of the spirit and the attitude of the entire nation at this time. Because everyone wants favor and everyone wants, whether it be the favor of God or the favor of men, people want to be blessed. And there's two ways to do that. Wait on the Lord and trust his timing or take matters into your own hands. And there's a temptation during this time to take matters into your own hands because that's what it looks like everybody else is doing. When everybody else is doing it, it, it creates a problem. Do you remember Hurricane Katrina or any hurricane or any devastation that comes through? The, the things we catch on the news when people who would normally be, be civilized begin to just totally trash and break into buildings, not just to steal food, to sustain their families, but go into malls and take the Gucci purchases because you're going to need those to survive. You know what I'm saying? And, and just like totally destroy things and, and, and things you would never do on your own, you begin to do in a group because you quit trusting the system. Does that make sense? Well, you can quit trusting God. And Israel needed a message. Don't quit pursuing the favor of God. And so, a story lies before us <clears throat> that helps us answer the question, why should we trust the favor of God's timing instead of taking uh, our fate into our own hands? Or maybe it answers the question, does God help those who help themselves? And the answer to that question is laid out before us in three deliberate movements through the text. Three sections of scripture that outline the answer to this question. And the first we see a contrast in character. First came Eli's family, and we already read that. Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, are described here in verse 12 as worthless men, literally the sons of Belial, meaning worthless. That's a, that's a terrible, that would be terrible to describe anybody. That's really bad to describe the priests of the temple. They're sons of Belial, who, it gets worse, who did not know the Lord. Did you read that? Think about the implications of what that means about a priest in the house of God. It says in verse 12, Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. What? They're priests in the temple, and they don't know the Lord. Now, they, they knew who God was. It's not like they didn't have information. They weren't ignorant of who God was. But the word means to know personally. It speaks of an experiential, personal knowledge. Though they were priests, they only knew about God. They did not know him personally. But what earned them this scathing description? Well, what we just read is that they abhorred the Lord's offering and took what they wanted for themselves. Now, it's an interesting story to a modern reader. Sometimes it can be hard to follow what the nuances are of the text. <clears throat> the writer, though, wants every reader to be very clear about just how significant their sin was. Though the example given in verses 12 through 17 could be seen as trivial or a bit obscured to modern readers, there's some significance here. So let me explain. As a priest during this time, in this phase in Israel's history, they were entitled to a portion of the sacrifices that were brought to the temple. And they wanted uh, uh, their portion, uh, Hophni and Phinehas, to be taken before it was cooked. Right? So you can imagine with, with tens of thousands of Israelites coming to the temple at all times throughout the year and at certain times uh, during the year, every time they come, they're bringing a sacrifice. And God's not a wasteful God. That's part of the system he described in the book of Leviticus to take care of the priests. That after a sacrifice was offered to the Lord symbolically, that, that meat would not go to waste, but it would be in turn given to the priests. And the particular 
The particular uh, tradition that they had during this time was to take a three-pronged hook, and in whatever uh, container that meat was being cooked, they throw in a hook, and whatever meat came out, that would be the priest's portion. After the fat was burned, the one thing the priest could never have was the fat, because the fat was considered the most sacred or holy part of the meat, and that was always the Lord's. Well, Hophni and Phinehas, they wanted it a little better. They didn't like the way it was cooked when the meat was boiled. They'd rather have it raw. They wanted to cook it just right. And so they asked those who came to the temple, and they said, listen, I, uh, they sent their servants, says, our, our master, our, the priest, would like you to give him the meat before it's cooked. And he said, well, well wait, um, can you at least cut off the fat and give that to the Lord? And, and then you can have whatever you want to your heart's desire, which even that was wrong. But the, but the answer was, no, you're going to give me what I want or I'll take it by force. Yikes. And, 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 and you see this story developing where all they're concerned about is themselves. <clears throat> the real sin was treating the sacrifices as if the point was not to give to the Lord, but to satisfy their own desires. That was never the point of the sacrifice. People were not bringing sacrifices to give to the priest. They were bringing sacrifices to give to the Lord. It, it even, I, I like, I sweat when I think about the, the parallel. If I gave a correlating illustration of me walking around with an offering plate, I'm like, hey, hey, no, 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 a little more. I know you got it. I just can't even imagine. I can't even imagine that. And then... To be like, one's, ah, here's a 10. 20, yeah. Huh? I just, it's, <laughs> like, how could they do that? But that was happening. That was happening. And they were, they were taking and skimming off the top what they thought would best serve themselves. And it was the custom of Eli's sons to take any part of the sacrifice they desired rather than their allotted portion and demanding the meat from the people before the fat had been burned as an offering to God. In essence... They disdained the offering of God, treating it irre irreverently and disrespectfully. In other words, you could say it this way. They had religion without faith. They didn't know God. It was religious show. It was, it was all spectator viewed and no relationship inside. It was hypocrisy. These two men saw the priestly role simply as a means of furthering their own ends. Their whole life was lived in the context of religion. It occupied their time. It paid their wages. But still, they had no real knowledge of God. They grew up as preacher's kids, if you will. They understood the ministry their whole life. Their dad was a high priest. They were raised in that, but they only knew religion. They knew no God awful one side on the other side of the equation you have Elkanah's family here's Eli's family no character at all here's Elkanah's family and you get a totally different picture don't you Elkanah's family is much different on the other hand Samuel and his family honored the Lord before before whom they ministered and God in turn gave them more than they asked but we, we stopped at verse 19 but look look at verse 20 and Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife, and said, The Lord give thee seed of this woman for the loan which is lent to the Lord. That would be Samuel. And they went unto their, home, their own home, and the Lord visited Hannah, so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters, and the child Samuel grew before the Lord. A totally different story. Here's Elkanah, he's taken his family every year to the temple. And here's Hannah, she's so excited to see her son. And she comes with a little ephod. I, I, lo I love that because he wasn't actually a priest at the time. But she wanted him to look the part. And she's like, all right, here's a little, oh, I think it'll fit just right. Oh, it's a little long, but you'll grow into it. And every year she's bringing him a new ephod. And she wants to make sure he looks appropriate for the house of the Lord. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I had this, I overheard this conversation in my own house this morning where a kid tried to walk out with some tennis shoes. And mom says, nope, 
That's not appropriate for the house of the Lord. We need to put on dress shoes. And you can see Hannah doing this. You can see Hannah saying, no, 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 no. Okay, you got the ephod just right and make sure it's clean. Now, listen, Samuel, go look in the mirror and check your face before you go into the temple. You know, she's making sure he looks right. Why? Because they're instilling into him that the Lord ought to be honored. And, and, and Hannah and Elkanah, they come and they offer their sacrifices. And you know what happens? Look, their mindset is not me first. Their mindset is God first. Their mindset is serve the Lord. Their mindset is put him first. And here's what happens. Here's what happens. They honor God and God honors them. And Eli says, the Lord bless you for the child you've lent to the, to the house of the Lord. And Hannah goes home and she has a, a whole kaggle of kids or whatever it's called. He's got a bunch, a couple of sons and daughters. What did it say again? Verse 21, And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the child Samuel, here's the best part, grew before the Lord. Samuel, not just grew as in size and stature, but grew in his reverence and respect for the Lord. The Lord had blessed them. <clears throat> There's a sharp contrast between the house of Eli and the house of Elkanah. Hannah's obedience and devotion to God resulted in great blessing. Not only did God give her three more sons and two daughters, but she also had the privilege of watching her firstborn son, Samuel, grow before the Lord. On one hand, uh, and again, that this text, it, it, is, it is a narrative. It's telling a story. But even in the story, you can see chapter 1 is a contrast in character, can't you? It's not hard to pick up what the writer is laying down. He's showing us a clear contrast, on, a contrast of character. On one side, the house of Eli, a hypocritical family who only knows religion. On the other side, Elkanah's family had a sincere relationship with the Lord. Eli's family lived for themselves. Elkanah's family lived for the Lord. It's a contrast, a contrast in character. And the next sept, ex, uh, section of Scripture in 22 through 26, you see a corresponding consequence. First is a contrast of character, then there's corresponding consequences to those character decisions. Let's read in verse 22, it says, Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto the Lord, uh, unto all Israel, and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. There seems to be corresponding consequences. The sons of Eli were out of favor with God and man. Besides the abhorring, sac abhorring the sacrifice, Eli's two sons also satisfied their sexual lusts with the women who came to worship at the temple. I, I, I can't even comprehend the kind of environment where that would take place in the house of God. The state of Israel's condition was as worse as, as you could ever possibly imagine. It was awful. It was awful. They were leading the people to transgress, and word was getting around. This was public knowledge, and Eli confronted it. Yet, he lacked the character to do anything about it. He had the right to remove his son from priestly service, but he made no attempt to do so. It says in, I think it's chapter 3, verse 13. I didn't write this down, but let me just see. For I have told him that I would judge his house forever for the iniquity 
which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. It's not simply, listen, it's not simply that Eli highlighted the fact that they were sinning, but he did nothing about it. He says, why are you doing this? You're making our family stink before the Lord and the people. This is wrong. And then as a dad, he did nothing. This is a whole lesson on a side note on parenting. You have to have some authority behind your leadership. God will hold you accountable for how you lead. Yes, it is appropriate to identify what is wrong, but use the authority you have to make it right. And he did nothing. As the high priest, he, he cannot stop them from sinning, but he can take them out of the office. He can rebuke them, as it says in chapter 3. He could have corrected the problem. He could have restrained them, but he did nothing but tell them he was disappointed. He had the right to remove his sons, but he did not. Eli's son's failure to listen was a result of their contempt, not only for their dad's authority, but for God's power. But the writer here presents it paradoxically as an expression of God's power. It looks like, in other words, that Hophni and Phinehas hear the words of their dad, like maybe the children of Lot heard their father and said, whatever. Okay, dad, like you care. They thumb their nose at their authority of their dad and, and at the power of God. But notice Though they believed they were in control, though they operated by the attitude of, hey man, God helps those that help themselves, and I'm just serving number one, I mean, I'm just taking what's rightfully mine, at the end, the Bible says in, in Samuel chapter 2, I'm going to get back there, Samuel chapter 2, verse 25, at the end of the chapter, notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. It's almost like, the author is hinting, whispering underneath the, the, the drama of the whole scene, the Lord is still in control. And though it may appear that they're out of control, God is operating his plan and sin will not go unpunished. He's still in control. But there's corresponding consequences, not just for the wicked, but for the righteous. And here's Samuel in verse 26, and the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. The two sons of Eli were out of favor with God and man, but Samuel was in the favor of God and man. The character of Samuel was also known among the people, and as a result, his favor among the people increased as he grew up. You think they didn't notice? Little Samuel, he must have been cute as a little kid, dressed in his little ephod. But as he grew, it was more than an outfit. It was a relationship. There was a walk with the Lord, even with this little kid. Before he fully understood the Lord and what it meant to serve him, he had reverence for God. He respected God. He, he, he listened to his parents, and he followed their example of their reverence for God, and he began to mimic that, and people took notice. And people paid attention. And as Samuel grew, the Bible says he grew in favor with men. People began to favor that and say, you know what? I can respect that. You know, I bet that little boy, that little Samuel, had an influence on some of that rowdy crowd coming in, treating the house of God as if it had no value. Here's a little boy, a little boy, I, I imagine like an Ethan Wood here, coming in. And, 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 and living for God and people taking notice and making him stand a little straighter. But he had more than just favor with men. He had favor with God. It's the third time since the book of Samuel began, since Samuel was born, that the Bible says that he grew in the Lord. And again, we're not talking about physical growth and height or stature. We're talking about a different kind of growth. It literally means to become great with God. Samuel was growing spiritually before the Lord. And here at the end of the second 
the second movement of this text, the second chapter of, of this story, as you might call it, we have another observation. Eli's family fell out of favor with God. Samuel increased in favor with God. Now, hopefully you see a story developing here. Because you have one family who's, who's bent on getting their just desserts, justly or unjustly. They're going to get what they think they deserve, and they're going to do whatever it takes to get it. And they're falling out of favor with God and man. And over here, you have a family dedicated to serving the Lord, not concerned about getting what they think they deserve, but giving to God what He deserves. And as a result, not only are they being blessed with more than what they asked for, they're growing in favor to God and man. And finally, we see the core principle of the story met by a man of God who comes to visit Eli. It's a little lengthy on the text, but beginning in verse 27, it says this. And there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me, speaking of the house of Aaron? And, and did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire with the children of Israel? Like, look, did, did I not select your lineage, your family heritage to serve in the temple and give him all these things to do in the house of the Lord? In verse 29, wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and <clears throat> at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation and honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Wherefore, the Lord, uh, the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and, thy, and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, be afar from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. If I was underlining, I might underline that passage because it just might be the theme, the thesis of the whole story. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house, that, and thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation, in all, the wealth, in all the wealth which God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever, and the, and the man of thine whom I shall not cut off from mine altar shall, uh, shall be to consume thine eyes, and to grieve thine heart and all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. And this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. And I will raise me up a faithful priest and shall do according to all which is in mine heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and shall say, Put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's office, that I may eat a piece of bread. Finally, we see a core principle of God at work. An unnamed prophet, an unnamed man of God delivers this message. And recalling the age of, uh, the, of Moses and Aaron, the prophet listed three duties of the priest. Offering sacrifice at the altar, assisting in prayer, and burning uh, uh, incense, and determining the will of God by means of the ephod for the people. This is what a priest did. And God had delivered that to a special tribe of people, to a special lineage in Aaron's line. And the Lord had promised Aaron's descendants would always be priests. And he had confirmed that promise with a covenantal oath. They would minister before the Lord forever. 
But because of flagrant disobedience, the house of Eli, like the house of Saul later, would be judged by God. And although the priesthood was perpetual, individual priests who sin could forfeit their covenantal blessing. In other words, blessings aren't guaranteed. They're conditional upon our faithfulness to God. And he came and he said, listen, just because you're of the lineage of Aaron doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want and disregard me and have no respect for me. Those who honor me, I will honor. And those who do not honor me, I will lightly esteem. And so we have the summary of the charge against Eli in verse 29 and beginning in verse 30, the announcement of judgment. You know what the core problem was? It's not that Eli did not love the Lord or did not know the Lord. The core problem was he honored himself and his sons above the Lord. This is the problem. He must have answered the question incorrectly. Does God help those of, who help themselves? And he said, yeah, I think so. I, I think I do need to trust my ability to get as much as I can. And you know what? As much as we throw stones at Eli's kids, do you know that Eli engaged in the same uh, disgrace in taking the fat of the offering for himself? It says in verse 30, <clears throat> it says, where, uh, I'm sorry, verse 29, Wherefore, kick ye up my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves yourselves to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. He was doing the same thing, just not quite so blatantly. And you, I hate to make the correlation, but you read in chapter 3, he was a fat man who fell over and broke his neck because of his weight. Do you know how he got there? Me first. That's how he got there. And he set a pattern... Maybe not to the level of dishonor towards God that his kids displayed, but he set the pattern for them to follow. I come first. I come first. And so he honored himself above the Lord and he honored his kids. As it says in verse 29, he honored his sons. The essence of Eli's sin was that by neglecting his responsibility to discipline his children, he actually esteemed his sons above the Lord. They were more valuable to him than his, than his own God. <clears throat> he never punished them. And although he warned his sons of divine judgment, he never corrected their sin. And so on verse 30, that <clears throat> sets forth the principle that with God, honor is reciprocal. And he says in verse 30, Be afar from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Eli had honored his sons more than he honored God. And so the description of divine judgment begins in verse 31. And it's pretty vivid. It's pretty gory. It says, essentially, God says, I'm going to cut off your arm and cut off your father's house. And you're going to be the last old man to ever come from your line. Whoa. Your children will both die in the same day and your seed will never produce another priest. You're done. You're done. You have dishonored me. I will dishonor you. Wow. <clears throat> Them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. There's so much that could be said about verse 35, and I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he will walk before mine anointed forever. Of course, the first thing that comes to mind, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, as it will deviate from the core message of the text, but it's a little prophetic statement here. First, of course, we're referring to Samuel as he's going to fill in for, for Eli. But Samuel's line is not to be a priest, per se. He is a prophet. 
And you think, well, maybe it's referring to the line of Zadok because the line of Zadok came in and took over in David's time, the house of Aaron, because they forfeited through uh, Abiathar and others, they forfeited their right to be in that priestly office. Then the line of Zadok came in and they took over and they're going to be serving right into the millennial kingdom, Scripture says. But I think we see a different high priest coming who will always do right before God, and that's the Messiah. And here in this note, by the way, this is all throughout the Old Testament. You get little snippets of this, little glimpses of it, like, like, like a, a, a dark sheet poked with holes that sheds light through them. Every once in a while, you get a glimpse of this truth that man needs a Savior, and a king won't do, and a prophet won't do, and a priest won't do. We need someone greater. And there is one coming. And that's Jesus Christ, the faithful high priest. He came. And he is now seated at the right hand of God. And he ever makes intercession for us. But thus we come to the end of the story. And we see a core problem and a controlling principle. The core problem is I come first. But the controlling principle of the whole story is God still has the last laugh. God is still in control. Them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. G. Campbell Morgan said this. He's my favorite commentator by far. Because reading him is like reading a diary with God. He does more than write information. And he said this. <clears throat> G. Campbell Morgan said, No human affection must be permitted to intervene between the soul and its absolute loyalty to God. See, the problem was, though Eli might have loved the Lord to some extent, he allowed his love for his own uh, uh, edification and his love for his own children to come between he and God. And this God will not allow. And so we come to the conclusion of the story. There is a governing principle at work in all of life. God feigns the faithless and he favors the faithful. He does. He does. And, and you know, in a, in a world where no one seems to be doing right and everything seems to be completely out of control, and it looks like the only good you're ever going to get out of this life is what you grab for yourself. It's tempting to think the Lord helps those who help themselves. It's tempting to believe that somewhere in the Bible, the book of Maccabees or something, but it's not there. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, why, why should I trust the timing of God's favor instead of taking matters into my own hands? Here's why. Because if you take matters into your own hands, your character will produce consequences because there's an overriding, controlling principle that can never be violated. If you dishonor God, he will not honor you. You're not going to find favor living in obstinance to God. You know what's better to do? To seek the Lord's favor in God's timing. To not put yourself first. And you know, that's one of the hardest things to do in this time and age. It is. I, 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 how many, I, if I had a show of hands, and I'm not going to do it, but if I asked you to raise your hands, I bet there are people in this room that have worked in work environments that expect you to do things that are unsavory in order to get ahead. I worked in those environments and I had low level jobs before I got into the ministry. I worked in jobs where it was like, well, this is just the expected thing. I know it's a little shady. I know we probably shouldn't do that, but this is the, you just got to do this. And, and I bet you we work in jobs and in scenarios where there's an attitude of, well, I mean, it's not like they're ever going to take care of us. Take advantage of the boss and whatever you can while you can get all you can. I mean, no one's going to hand it to you. And some people buy into that. It's like, well, I mean, hey, we, we, got, we, got it, we got to take care of ourselves. Friend, no, you don't. Listen, 
as hard as it is to trust God in a chaotic world that cares nothing about God, that, that doesn't even seem to operate by any moral code at all, can I convince you, can I beg you to put your faith in God and trust in his favor? He's still in control. It might not work in the timing you're thinking. He'll still take care of you. I, even as a pastor, look, I, 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 I hope I can say this without coming across weird about it. But there have been way too many times, way too many anniversaries of pastoring here, way too many Christmases that have come and gone, that I as a pastor haven't received so much as a card from anybody. Now, that doesn't happen all the time, but it's happened. And there has been a lack of honor at times that should have been there. And there's a way to approach that. Well, I'm... Uh, well, I, I looks like I'm on my own. Got to take care of myself. Or, or you can say, Lord, I'm doing this for you. I want you to have the glory. And the funny thing is, he always makes up for it. He always blesses in ways you could never have blessed yourself. Don't you know he loves you? Don't you, he, don't you know he knows the job you have? He knows the marriage you have? How would you like to be married like Abigail to a, a husband who was a son of Belial like she was? Uh, I, I mean, there's situations in life that are out of our control. And we get this idea, well, you, you, look, I know it's not, not the right thing to do, but this is the only thing I can do to make myself happy. Friend, don't violate the laws of God to get what you want. Well, I know divorce isn't right, and I know this isn't right. I know an affair isn't right, but it's just not working out. Will you trust God? Listen, he's in control. doesn't mean everything's going to work out. It doesn't mean the world operates perfectly when we serve the Lord. But don't you know he knows your situation, and he is still in control, and you can trust his timing, and his favor is far better than anything this world can ever give. Than anything. Well, my parents always favor my siblings, or they don't always see what happens in the house. And wrongs are never always right. And first of all, will you give your parents a break? They, they say they have eyes in the back of the head, but they don't always see everything that happens. But don't you know the Lord does? Don't you know he sees? And don't you know he cares? And don't you know it's far better to seek his favor? than to favor yourself. Friend, trust the Lord. He lays out this story before the nation of Israel. And yes, it's about Eli and his sons and how Samuel came on the scene, but it's also not. It's about a nation of Israel anxious to help themselves. We need a king. We, no, 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 we need what everybody else has. Please give us what we want. And God's saying, wait a second, wait a second. Trust me. Trust my timing. Trust my control. I love you. I know what you need. Don't take matters into your own hands. It'll never turn out the way you want. Trust me. Trust me. It's like that song we sang. In his time... In his time, he makes all things beautiful. In his time, Lord, please show me every day. You know what? I shouldn't have even started that because I don't remember the rest of it. In his time, the Lord knows. The Lord knows. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, What area of life does this not apply to? I look to our politics, Lord, and I'll be honest. I don't feel like they're fair. I certainly don't feel like there's any politician worth trusting. And it feels so out of control. It makes people think and say and act and do things in their own power because we don't trust you really. Lord, I look at the situation with our young people, not our young people per se, but the young people that are in our nation. And 
it, it seems like a lost cause. And I, I see the things in our schools as every other person here does. And I, I see just the state of our nation and our general morality. And it seems hopeless. God, would you help us remember that we can trust you? That it's better to seek your favor than to favor ourselves. That it's better to trust you than to take matters into our own hands. Because the good that you can provide can so outshine all the favor we can gather to ourselves. And Lord, what we do with a rotten character will always come back to haunt us, Lord. You are a just God, and you will not let your people sin and get away with it. Let us put our faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As the piano plays, I don't know what it is.